Thank you so much for being with us, Anket, and it's glad to have you. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Thanks for having me, first of all. No problem. Um, Anket, let's kick off with something um, that's uh, that has become kind of the um, Southeast Asian uh, maxim for getting into places like uh, Facebook and Uber, that in getting into places like IIT is probably harder than getting into Facebook. And, you know, Indian parents share only the pride moment when their children go to IIT and uh, they probably don't even know about fan companies. So what was your experience like getting into IIT? Oh, yes. Uh, so I think IIT, uh, obviously, uh, it was very nice when you get in, but the process of getting in is obviously very hard. Um, the reason it's hard is also because uh, I think uh, there are a lot of applicants for a limited number of positions inside IIT. And then the, for me, the process was that uh, up till like, so basically you give, so the process is that you give the, this exam, which is known as Joint Entrance Examination, JEE, um, and that happens after your 12th standard. So then people start preparing for a few years before. Uh, and for me, I was not decided that I want to go into engineering up until like almost end of 10th standard. What do you want and, to do? Uh, I actually, my father is like a CPA in India. Uh, so I wanted to do uh, like more accounting and other things initially because it's just influence of the family. Uh, but then I realized that I love maths too much to give up. Um, so, so for the love of maths, actually, I decided that I'll maybe take up engineering because it has more maths than, than accounting, uh, which is like more generic thing uh, in terms of mathematics. So, um, so I think that switch came around the uh, uh, end of 10th standard when I started realizing that I want to do more maths uh, than less maths. Um, so I think that's when I kind of decided to go for it. At the same time though, in India at that time, uh, in my city, uh, the, the amount of training or coaching you can say was not very profound and the exam was very competitive. So uh, I think there is a city in India which is known as Kota. Uh, where people kind of go to to kind of train for ITJ or at least at that time people used to go to a lot uh, and I decided to kind of uh, just spend my next two years uh, locked down into a room in a city where I've never visited before um, which was full of students uh, at that time uh, so basically that was the process after 10 standard um, and then the interesting fact is that even into getting into coaching institutes, uh, which are of top rank, you have to give an entrance exam. So it's like an entrance exam of entrance exams. Uh, so I think you can imagine the level of uh, competition in the overall uh, things. Um, so I gave that entrance exam. Luckily, I got into the top coaching institute. Um, I packed my bags, first time getting out of the home uh, without the parents. Uh, and then I just went to um, Kota to study uh, for IIT JE, which is the joint entrance examinations. For the next two years, I think um, it was just like uh, 12 hours plus straight study every day. Um, and there was literally no sports, um, not much interaction. And that time we didn't have phone or phones also with us. Um, so there was literally no other thing to do other than maybe play some cricket with some friends in the evening. And that's about it. Um, and, and even to call my parents at that time, I didn't have mobile phones. So we had this like STD PCO booth kind of thing where you have to stand in line, go, go in the night, stand in the line, and then talk to your parents like 15 minutes or so. And that also cannot happen every day because you cannot stand in line every day. So it's like every few days. So that was a kind of environment. Uh, but overall, I think it helps you to become independent. Uh, it helps you understand the value of hard work. Uh, overall. Um, and I think those are the things I took it away. And, and it also helps to forge some lifelong partnerships or friendships with people uh, that you're studying together with. Um, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the 12th standard, uh, luckily I got selected uh, in IIT JE. Uh, and then finally I, uh, I went to IIT Bombay. Uh, which is the, one of the colleges in the IIT leagues in Mumbai. Very interesting. You know, one of the things that I noticed um, for people who don't know, um, IITs are probably the Indian version of uh, MIT and, you know, made on the model of um, MIT. One of the things that I've noticed is that, um, especially when I 
went to study abroad for the first time noticed that you know studying um in probably european or u.s universities um it's probably a lot easier once you have gone through such um, immense pressure uh, in IIT than in other competitive institutions. I was just wondering, what was your experience like? Was it that hard? Um, for example, I used to study six courses back in university, and I, I'm pretty sure that's the same uh, in IIT. And when you go to other places, at least in my experience, it was like one course after another course. It was like a piece of cake for me. Um, and how, how was that for you? I mean, how did you find the education culture different um, between US and India? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. So I, I think uh, the the overall thinking is like, uh, first of all, like once you are inside a college uh, in terms of let's say IIT, for example, in engineering, uh, the amount of work pressure compared to when you are studying to get in is much less, first of all. Um, because I think people are also a little bit relaxed and engineering and I, I think the way it works, at least in India, is like, um, uh, is like obviously it's well structured in terms of the courses and everything uh, from an IIT perspective, and you get good knowledge, but the pressure uh, is more peer, I would say, uh, than the academic pressure, uh, at least in undergrad. Uh, and I think for me, what happened was my postgrad, uh, and I didn't do undergrad from US, so I don't have a direct apples to apples comparison. Um, so undergrad from India and postgrad from UC Berkeley. Uh, obviously, postgrad is very intensive, and also people are more mature at that point that they can invest uh, more efforts into what they want. And in, particularly in undergrad, like people are still figuring out uh, what needs to be done. So the major change I find uh, is that uh, uh, obviously IITs are very rigorous as compared to other institutes, but I found that. Um, uh, I found I found that U.S. universities also have a very good coursework overall, uh, which uh, actually kind of grooms you in the right shape. Having said that, I think the uh, the competition I used to find at IIT, uh, at least in my experience, was much higher uh, from peers compared to uh, in my U.S. stint in terms of postgrad. Interesting. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of anecdotes about, you know, how miserable life is um, in IITs and, you know, when you get out of it, then you probably uh, reap benefits. But during that, you don't have those moments. But we're going to get back on that. Let's talk about a little bit about your work. Um, you have worked in diverse um, organizations working on uh, multifaceted problems, um, contributing to scientific literature. Um, your papers in your IPS, um, iClear, um, are very fascinating. I've gone through some of them. But let's talk about um, your work at Uber Eats. Um, and that's a huge undertaking. So when you have a portal that serves um, 3,020, um, 320,000 um, restaurant partners over 500 cities, um, 36 countries, and then you have to make um, a recommendation system that serves best in the line recommendations and increase engagement. Um, tell us about your paper that you wrote um, that's on the Uber Eats blogs also. I find it very um, interesting how you use actually graphical um, neural networks over the traditional uh, machine learning prediction models. Yes, I think uh, for that one, uh, so the setup was that I was uh, at Uber in Uber AI, which was more of a research lab. And we, uh, our job was to kind of find out new interesting machine learning areas, which can have applications and also do fundamental research, which can have applications first in Uber and also do like some uh, new techniques development. Um, so in this case, like I was looking into uh, this graph learning area, um, and what I realized was that Pinterest at that time was pretty much the pioneer to kind of come up with a new approach on using graph learning for their recommendations. <clears throat> at that time, like uh, I understood that maybe this is some um, this is something that maybe uh, our our company can use essentially. So there was no application of graph learning at that time. So I tried to find the application which was like uh, maybe appropriate for something like this. And Uber Eats recommendation is an obvious choice. So the, what we did essentially was um, Uber Eats is like, obviously there is a three-sided three -sided marketplace uh, in terms of you have couriers, uh, delivery partners, you can say, and then you have users and then you have restaurants. And then if you think about it, uh, what you're ordering is ordering from a restaurant, a particular dish, uh, which people have liked or kind of commented on like what, how this dish is. So then there is a rich source of food graph, as you can say, 
uh, which is there in terms of like what kind of food we have in the platform on the platform and what kind of food we have ordered. And you can construct a very big, large graph uh, for something like this. So what we essentially did was uh, we tried to uh, understand how graph interactions uh, between users and food or uh, dishes, for example, uh, can, can improve uh, or can learn something new, which is not being there in the Uber Eats platform. So I think that's how uh, the graph learning project came about. Uh, and overall, I think we were to apply cutting edge techniques plus customized to Uber exactly or Uber Eats exactly and use them uh, to drive uh, more product adoption overall. So, and the, and the techniques we use was like uh, Graph Sage, which was developed at Sanford and also was used at Pinterest, but we developed our own version of Graph Sage to apply to Uber Eats. Um, if you look at the metrics, your model was uh, deployed globally, which is a huge thing for an engineer, you know, when the company decides actually to roll out their product. So congratulations for that. And you were able to achieve 20, 12 percent um, improvement over your matter, uh, matrix uh, factorization model. Um, I'm just wondering, this is a very subjective uh, field uh, to be establishing some kind of metrics, for example, it, how much customers are going to like the new uh, suggestions versus the old suggestions. So how did you actually establish a metric for that that worked for the company uh, and in general for the sales? Sure, I think for uh, Uber Eats, the metric uh, is very clear. Uh, if people like the suggestion, they will order more. And when people order more, that's how Uber, business, Uber Eats business model is. Like they want people to order more through their platform or maybe help people find the right food at the right time. Uh, so the way we measure this is like, uh, obviously there is an offline AUC evaluation that you're talking about. Uh, at the same time, we the gold truth is like what happens when we roll this out as an A-B test uh, to users. So when we roll this out at A-B test, like can we say that a treatment group ha is having more orders in general uh, as compared to um, control group? And if that is the case, then, then, then it proves that uh, whatever we are optimizing for uh, is actually the right thing for the business. Uh, because now we are getting more orders by rolling out this algorithm versus the previous one that we already had. So I think for us, that was the metric that we cared about. And I think if you contrast with some other companies, uh, we don't care, uh, like at Uber Eats, we didn't care like, uh, like how many times people have viewed that dish. Like that didn't help us, like we didn't have an ad model. Uh, so that didn't help us. So what actually helped was, did you order that dish or not, essentially? So that was the metric. One of the things that I noticed um, when I was reading those blog, blog posts, which was written uh, wonderfully, you know, it, it made a very good depiction of uh, what technology you uh, used and how many nodes you um, put all your data into and then you know, the edges between those nodes. Um, one of the things that I was just wondering, I used to work for um, a company, which is I think uh, a multi-billion company now called Affinity. Um, long time ago, it was called Center. So what they try to do that is um, from the interactions between um, the uh, callers and the agents, and they found some kind of um, correlation between uh, the weather, um, the agent type and the caller. And then they use this um, for predicting the results um, of the outcome of the call and uh, was it a pleasant experience or not. And I was just wondering, do you also use some kind of weather predictors um, or the day of the month um, or the salary in your models, um, especially when it comes to recommendation foods, for example, um, I don't know about uh, other places, but certainly there are rainy days, which are good and then there are sunny days. They're good for some people and they like to order more on those days. And I was just wondering if weather was one of the components for that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the information we use, uh, so not exactly weather, uh, and um, like some implicit information was there, which I can con cannot talk about, but um, but the overall thing was what we used in the model was day of the day, uh, uh, day of the week, sorry, and time of the day. Now, obviously we want our model to recommend, let's say if you like pizza, <clears throat> we don't want you to recommend pizza on let's say Monday morning, but definitely on Friday night. Uh, that you might order, right? So we want to incorporate that preferences in terms of time that people have uh, for a particular food that like. And for that reason, we want, we incorporate that through like day of the week, time of the uh, day of the week, time of the day features, uh, which kind of help us get that preference built in into the model. Uh, at the same time, we also used some of the node features in our dish recommendations were like price of the dish. So, if you have ordered more pricier dish in general, 
I think you have affinity in terms of like similar pricier dishes. So the graph used to learn that information uh, in terms of what is the price of the dish, what is the cuisine type of the dish and other parts. So overall, I think I'll say is that uh, whatever information we had, which was privacy aware um, and not peeking into like salary data is like very private in some sense, we didn't have that. And I think we didn't use it also. Um, so whatever information we had access to, uh, we were trying to bake that in into one large graph so that uh, we can learn effectively uh, in terms of preference of time, day, and also what foods you like. And just for the cakes, what is the most favorite food in US? Oh, uh, it depends which city you're looking. Uh, <laughs> but pizza, you can say, is like a very famous, uh, very famous food. And is it on the game nights or is it like on average, you know, people um, order that on weekends or... Um... So obviously over the weekends it's higher. Okay. Uh, but overall, so I think if you count the number of pizzas ordered versus not, I think that was at least that when I when I saw the data, it was very high. It kind of explains why two thirds of US uh, population is obese also. Uh, but let's move on to, um, you know, some of the great people that you work with. And I was just wondering, did your tenure actually um, coincide with uh, Raquel uh, Ultrasund um, at Uber, uh, who was a chief sci data scientist. And now I think she's moved on to uh, autonomous uh, driving a startup of her own called Wabi. Um, tell her if you have had her experience and what kind of changes she introduced um, to the AI research lab. Yeah, I think the, uh, the one thing I want to qualify is, so Raquel's group was uh, in Toronto at that time. Okay. And that was more focused on autonomous driving. So our chief science, so uh, my group was Uber AI Labs, which was more focused towards the rides and eats business uh, than autonomous driving. Although we did have some interactions in terms of the graph work and other things, but the, the person who used to lead our group was Zubin Gharamani, who was the chief scientist of Uber. Uh, and now he's at Google Brain, essentially. Um, so, so, he, so he was a guy I majorly interacted with. I had some interactions with Raquel, but that was more towards like, how can we collaborate on graph learning research and other things and less about uh, autonomous driving. Do you think graph learning has also applications for um, computer vision in the sense that's going to outperform our current uh, benchmarks? Uh, yes, in some sense. So I think uh, there was a recent research published also uh, in terms of scene detection uh, or maybe scene manipulation so you can think of an image as a various uh, nodes in the graph um, in some sense, like you have different objects, let's say you have a lake, you have a house and you have a mountain in the same uh, image. And then those could be connected uh, basically once you detect the segmentation on each particular things. So overall, I think the, the idea is that people are starting to think about uh, these Euclidean structures, which are images also in graph sense uh, because now you can incorporate much more longer range dependencies as compared to when you had a filter on convolutional neural networks, which are like three by three or five by five, uh, and also only limited field of scope. But with graph, you can have this model uh, uh, learn some long range dependencies, uh, and that can improve the overall um, overall accuracy of the system. So uh, I think there has been recent research on like, um, uh, I think it was a paper from Facebook, I think, uh, where you can just uh, have a tool which you can move around. Let's say I want to see here in the image and I want a mountain here in the image and you just put the pieces and uh, a new image was constructed for you. Um, so, so the or and that is backed by some graphical networks uh, which kind of learn the dependency uh, between things uh, and try to generate an image for that. I think um, I haven't actually looked deeper into that, but Zubin is such a wonderful um, researcher. You know, his um, work at, at Cambridge and later at um, Alan Turing uh, Institute was um, really influential, especially his work on um, the novel infinite dimensional non parametric models. Um, such as infinite and latent feature model it was something that I was really interested in. I was just wondering, do you also have some kind of latent modeling uh, work um, in Uber or even now uh, in your job as um, researcher at Facebook? Latent, uh, so I would say uh, like uh, when you try to learn some representations, uh, they are always in latent space. And my entire 
like work has been generating those representations. So if you talk about Uber Eats, for example, uh, which is I have generated latent representations of users and dishes and restaurants in the same space, in the same latent space, so that they can we can learn the closeness interactions and other things in terms of like similar dishes or similar users or similar restaurants even. And similarly, I think uh, we have done some done work on fraud detection at Uber, uh, which is also out as a blog post on the Uber website. Um, um, that also is like we are trying to learn some uh, some representation of riders and drivers uh, and their interactions so that we can represent all in the same latent space in terms of embeddings and user embeddings in downstream. Um, so I think, uh, and, and, uh, and there are some latent uh, representations we used to do at Uber AI also is like, can we represent a trip as a vector or an, as an embedding uh, of an Uber trip and try to find similar trips uh, to understand uh, what kind of trips people are taking and people are not taking uh, like commute trips could be one segment and then you can have non-commute like leisurely trips as another segment. So learning those embeddings um, at scale, which are like a latent representations helped us get to a many downstream applications, uh, which kind of uh, helped the Uber business eventually. I just wondering, since, yeah, sure, go ahead. No, I think I was just, one last sentence is like, I'm like doing similar work at Facebook also, but I'm trying to learn some latent representations for downstream product applications. I was just wondering when it comes to um, subjects like humans who are very um, fickle and changeable, how do these um, latent space learnings translate to different domains in a multimodal um, context where you have different kinds of data um, and then you know concatenating that and making predictions that are going to turn valid also not only in the short run on the batch, um, data, but also um, live stream data. Do you think that that has been a particular challenge for uh, machine learning um, engineers and researchers? Yeah, I think uh, I think the next phase of research because the data is getting multimodal now. Even if you think about it, the video itself is like very changing, right? There is a long form YouTube video, and then it's a TikTok style short form videos, um, and then you have text, which is like I think now uh, unanimous everywhere. Uh, or ubiquitous everywhere, sorry. Um, and also like we have other kinds of data sets, uh, images and other things. So tying all those together in an effective fashion and learning representations in the same space so that we can know the interaction on like which are, which which text is similar to what video, for example, or, or like um, learning about a particular user on what kind of text user or uh, uh, text video or short form video uh, user interacts with. Uh, learning the preference of the user from that is like a, obviously a major, major problem uh, that people are investing on. Uh, and I think it can add a lot more value in terms of personalization overall in companies uh, to kind of understand user behavior in a holistic fashion, where it was pretty much pretty much first focused on like one dimension, like say maybe YouTube team is doing, I'm just guessing, but YouTube team is doing understanding on only YouTube interaction of uh, me versus YouTube interaction plus Google search plus something else, uh, which can help drive the overall business and uh, learn about the user preferences much better. Um, the um, research that you have um, done at um, Uber Eats about notifying different um, aspects like customers and restaurants um, and different um, dishes, these look like these are um, structured data. Do you also have instances or have you worked with some instances where you had multi multimodal data that you had to vectorize, put them together and create some kind of cor correlation or graph? Um, and then it turned out to be a um, successful model, at least um, overperforming than the ones that you already had. Yeah, I think uh, one good example in Uber Eats case also was, if you think about it, uh, a dish, right? Uh, a dish is, has obviously a text on the name of the dish, right? It also has ingredients uh, and it also has a description, uh, actually, what kind of dish is it? Like it's describing what dish is it is. And, and the, when the way uh, I think previously we did was we didn't include any kind of understanding of that text or ingredients or the description of the dish in the initial model that we were developing. But then what we did was we learned another latent representation just for that descriptions. Uh, you can say word to work style representations. Um, and that helped us to incorporate that data again in the graph. So you can see it's a multimodal graph where you have 
some interaction data from user to dishes, uh, but also you have a text data, which is like a dish description or something like that uh, related to that. And also you can incorporate that. And another thing you were trying is you have a dish photo, uh, which uh, actually you like, there is some pizza, uh, there's a photo of that pizza. Uh, maybe uh, you can extract some information from there because people are attracted sometimes to the photos to kind of order uh that particular dish so we were also thinking about like i think uh, at my time i was not able to get to it but uh we were also thinking about extracting some information from the images also that we saw so you can see that people don't interact by just seeing price of the dish or the name of the dish uh, or the restaurant itself they interact with everything about description about ingredients about um, images so we have to bake all of that in into one particular model to learn the better preferences of the user. I was just wondering um, if you spin the question in a way um, to make it more you know, understandable and long-term, if you can lure the customers into buying different dishes based on uh, the pictures, based on the data and the previous experiences, the reviews or anything, what about the um, experience that they have after eating the dish? I mean, how much they recommend the dish um, to others once they have uh, tried that and then use that as um, some kind of recommendation because, you know, it, it's easier to get them to try it for the first time, but it's really hard to get them to, you know, stick to that dish for longer term. And that might be the more, um, you know, repeat business um, and, you know, an area worth researching. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think that's a fair point. And I think for that reason itself, we wanted to learn the preferences of a particular person uh, so that we recommend the dishes he had ordered multiple times or sim dishes similar to the dishes he has ordered multiple times or she has ordered multiple times. So in the graph, what we used to have was to kind of capture like uh, an example I'll give, uh, we have multiple things, but an example I'll give is like, if a user has ordered a dish, for example, Right, we in the graph edge between user and dish, we used to have a weight which is how many times this has uh, been ordered in the last whatever one year or something like that. Right, and this kind of captured the preference that this edge has more weight as compared to this has less weight. And the model used to learn the preferences like that that this is the kind of dish I like more, this is the kind of dish I just I tried once. And another piece of information we had is rating. I think people give rating at the end of the at the end of the uh, uh, order uh, and we used to incorporate that information also in terms of ratings uh, for whatever data we had um, into the model itself to learn the preferences. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about your um, hobbies and not only the work that you do um, and that seems to be a common theme between a lot of our guests that you know they do something to um, plug them out of the matrix that they are into and for you that seems to be marathons um, and you have run multiple marathons and I'm just wondering how do you even find the time to actually be fit for that and you know practice for that and then appear for that um, with all kind of the all the um, hustle and bustle of your uh, intellectual life yeah I think for me uh, uh, it's it's kind of an important part of my work life uh, because when I finish work in the evening the one thing I want to get to is running uh, so that I can refresh my mind and do something else um, so I would say this is like a breaking point in terms of like uh, uh, like I when I finish work uh, I go for a run and then I do something else so it's kind of a bridge between my personal and private, uh, personal and professional life, is, if you can say so. But somehow, uh, I think I started just to lose some weight, to be honest, like six, seven years back. I, I used to be a little fat at that time. Uh, so I just wanted to lose some weight at that time. Uh, and I started, when I started, I think I, I used to, even for running one mile, I used to get so much tired uh, that I, I don't know, like, how will I sustain something like this, I used to feel. Um, but I think uh, it's it just the nature of thing. Once you're consistent with something, uh, you will kind of improve from then on. And I think one mile led to two mile. Then I joined a group, uh, which is a training for a 10K initially. And I kind of basically a bunch of friends who kind of asked me to join the group. Um, and I joined the group in Berkeley. At that time, I ran the uh, first, first half marathon, essentially with San Francisco half. And from then on, I think it just became uh, part of the habit that I have. Uh, in just running if I'm not doing anything so that I can take a break from uh, other parts. So for me, it's, yeah, as I said, it's more of a stress buster and um, break between uh, personal and professional lives. 
what's your advice for the couch potato geeks at IIT at the moment um, who are looking for some kind of inspiration to you? Um, like, do you control your diet or do you have a strict reminders uh, network to go out and run? Um, like, how do you people actually stay fit um, with a job that requires you to um, sit in a chair for a longer time? Yeah, I think uh, the hardest part I've found pretty much uh, is 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 that don't target um, like I'm going to run this much mile today or I'm going to mind, run this much miles this year, which is also fine. I do that at some at some place. However, just target that I'll just put on my running shoes as soon as I finish my work. Uh, I think just thinking that way in terms of changing the gear from a running uh, from a professional gear to a running gear that itself will kind of force you to go out uh, and run for at least five minutes, 10 minutes. It doesn't really matter um, as long as you're running it every day or every two days. Um, and, and don't try to aim for marathons directly. I think that's another thing I didn't do. I was not thinking about marathons at all, actually. Um, I was just trying to kind of um, lose some weight as like whatever your motivation is at that time. Um, I think you can just focus on that. Um, in terms of diet, yeah, obviously try to control some things uh, as you feel relevant. Uh, for me, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat uh, meat at all. Um, so for me, that is a control in that sense. But, uh, but whatever works for people, I think that's how it should be um, done. Yeah, I think and, and I think more importantly, associate with people who are of similar mind frame, like we join a group, a running group or something, and then you realize that yeah, you realize that you actually kind of get along with those people and all automatically start running more and more. Okay. Um, let's get back to Uber. Um, and I don't know, for some reason, Uber drivers uh, must absolutely hate you um, because you develop a one in a um, lifetime a solution for um, detecting fraud using relational graph convolution network and by that it decreased the fraud and collusion between drivers and the riders by 10 percent which already is in the multi-million um, dollar uh, space so i was just wondering how did you actually come up with this and do you also receive some kind of backlash uh, from the drivers and riders for some of them who actually know your work yeah i think the um... The, the reason this project came about was more around like, we know that um, people like try to create similar accounts with similar devices or similar vehicle number uh, or VIN number of vehicles uh, and try to create multiple accounts to conduct fraud. So if you disable one account, they will create another account to kind of do it. Um, and I think we also knew what kind of frauds that were happening. Um, I think at that time, uh, when I was thinking about this problem, uh, I stumbled upon uh, a, a paper from Alibaba, which also uh, used fraud detection, uh, uh, graph learning for fraud detections. Although they did use exactly uh, relational GCNs, uh, but I think the idea was uh, on the similar lines. So that got me excited that maybe something similar uh, could be done at Uber. Uh, and from then on, like I started investigating more on the problems, talking to people, and that's how the project came out. Now, in terms of like, how did we roll out this model and in terms of how uh, people perceived it, uh, I think the complete rollout happened after me, I left. So I don't know the exact perception, uh, but I think the initial thing that we were testing on, um, so whatever uh, more detection we used to do, it obviously passed through some human labeling to confirm. So uh, I think we try to avoid false positives as much as positive possible so that we don't have a bad experience. Uh, yeah, but I think for, uh, I think we detected some uh, some some accounts you can say uh, which were not uh, doing the right thing, um, and for that we had to take action. So I'm I'm guessing that that will uh, help people to do the right thing uh, in their life in general. I think ten percent is a um, lot of people when you look in at the size of um, how many drivers and riders there were. Uh, there was they were they were bound to actually have some kind of. Um, you know, feedback from the drivers and um, riders. Did you, did you also experience that? And, you know, there were a lot of people who were unhappy about that. So I think the 10% is not a number of drivers or riders. It's 10%, I think, uh, um, first of all, it's offline. And then the online results is a little different, uh, but it's on the number of trips. 
Um, so it's not exactly uh, like the ten percent of overall driver set. So do you uh, mean ten percent of the trips that were fraudulent, or do you mean they were ten percent of the cases out of all um, riders or drivers? What do you mean by ten percent? Yeah, ten percent reduction in overall fraud is what I'll say. Okay. Uh, and then the way we kind of think about that is like now, obviously, that things might have changed after that. Uh, but at least at my time, uh, the, the way we were thinking about this is like um, is like how many more trips we can detect out of this in terms of fraud. Uh, and previously, if you were detecting 10 trips, for example, now we are detecting 11 trips. Uh, so I think that that's the idea uh, in terms of detecting more trips uh, who are like which are fraudulent. And then uh, this is the, uh, the number you're seeing, I think, on the blog is is all the, also offline results. Uh, and then their online result was a little different, which was not quoted in the blog. Um, yeah. So, um, so, so I think the like the the detection was not on directly on people side; it was more on the trip side. And then, if trip needed to did, like disabling of an account on a driver or rider side, then that's a separate thing on that front. Okay, you know, one of the great things about your work is that it's so nuanced and multifaceted that, you know, uh, it kind of amazes me that there are different domains that you have worked in. Uh, for example, you also worked uh, with such a fantastic um, discipline um, in Uber, um, which kind of relates with the behavioral economics, where you used LSTM based uh, neural networks for the driver's sensitivity sensitivity towards the um, reward. And I was just wondering, tinkering the fine line between where you will have a churn and you know drivers would leave and you know the threshold where they would require enough, um, they have enough incentive to stay actually there. What would be the, um, and how do you even determine that through modeling? Yeah, I think uh, basically the idea was that uh, um, like Uber used to give incentives um, at least 2018-19 uh, when I was doing this. Um, uh, so Uber used to give a lot of incentive to drivers like two, 10 trips, get $50, something like that, right? Uh, but some of the incentives was not utilized uh, and some of the incentive was overutilized in the sense that people could have done just more and they were, they were given less dollars uh, for doing that. So we wanted to kind of uh, like understand this uh, behavior uh, on like, um, like if I have hundred dollars to spend on incentives, should I spend entirely hundred dollars on this kind of plan for San Francisco, or should I split between, let's say, uh, one kind of plan for San Francisco and one kind of plan for Los Angeles, right? Um, and so the idea was that um, how do you come up with the sensitivity of a driver towards the incentive behavior? Now, if you think about it, uh, there are various kinds of drivers. Uh, some people do it part time. Uh, some people do it full time. Some people do it for uh, X amount of money. Let's say, for a, uh, example, I need three thousand dollars to run my home. Uh, I'll try to work for three thousand dollars, and as, if I hit my three thousand dollars within fifteen days, I'll stop working. Even if you give me more incentives, I'll just not do it. Uh, so I think there are different kinds of behavior in different parts of cities, and also within different cities. Um, so the overall idea was, if we just start from ground up which is like per driver level data rather than per city level data directly, can we learn a better preferences of drivers, uh, which can help uh, in a kind of optimizing our budget and also help driver in the sense that people who need to have more, um, like more, more uh, incentives uh, because they are working very hard also, or they deserve it more. I think transferring the dollars to that kind of people versus uh, not. But although I think one thing I want to highlight is that we were not uh, doing distinguishing drivers within the same city. So you will not say that if I'm a driver and somebody else is a driver, uh, we both were getting different incentives just because we are both different. I think that's not right. What we were doing is like doing from ground up, but ultimately we are optimizing for one city incentive versus not a city incentive. So we are implementing at an aggregate level, but we're trying to learn from an individual level. I think um, results from that study would be very interesting in understanding a little bit about, about human psychology and why people actually choose to be Uber drivers. And I'm just wondering if you can shed some light on your experiences out of that experiment. Um, what are the 
you know, the basic reasons why some people drive, how long they drive, is it more common among students? Um, depending on which cities, of course, you know, that's uh, based on um, geography where you're located at. But, you know, as for example, if you want to pick some one geography and talk about, you know, why do people actually do that and, you know, how long they do that, it certainly gives us some insights um, into the economy um, and the, the reasons why people choose to have some these careers. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think obviously I cannot quote a geography directly uh, due to confidentiality reasons. But but the idea would be that um, let's say for for uh, an obvious answer is like for a student, I think that would be a supplemental income out of the college uh, work they have, or maybe support themselves uh, uh, while they are in the college. So I think for for them it's mostly part time or maybe full time on the weekend or something. Uh, but it's mostly part time to supplement their income. So if they need thousand dollars, they will just take thousand dollars and maybe just enjoy their time after that. Um, for some people who want to kind of run a family uh, and uh, through, uh, this is one of their core jobs to do, uh, for them, yes, for them it is like a full-time thing that they start to log in at 8 a.m. in the morning and then maybe sometimes I've seen people log out as like 10 p.m. also, like so they're driving very long time. Uh, and for them, I think it's just uh, earning the maximum that they can um, uh, so that they can support their family better. So it's a full-time gig for them. And then sometimes people have, like another part of students is like people have multiple jobs. So it's like, I might be driving for Uber on Monday, but Tuesday I'm going to Walmart to work uh, and Wednesday I'm driving again for Uber or something like that. So people have this like multi-jobs kind of thing also, even if they are doing full-time, but they're not doing full-time on all days. Uh, they are doing full-time on some days. Uh, so I think uh, depending on which city you look at, uh, depending on which segment of the city you look at, uh, and depending on the population segment in terms of age groups and other, I think people have different preferences. Um, and we want to kind of build a model uh, or understand the data much better so that we can cater to those people in a more effective manner. And I think they should have a, like, I think the core idea was to have a drivers to have a great experience on the platform. At the same time, we want to also wanted to optimize how we spend uh, money at Uber. Very interesting. Um, and I think a good segue into, um, into complex uh, reasons for why people do things and making relations. So let's talk about um, something. I was part of the Stanford Computing um, Forum workshops on uh, graphical uh, neural networks uh, yesterday. Uh, it was a wonderful workshop. And, and by the way, um, Stanford professor um, Yus Leskovich, who also happens to be the chief data scientist for uh, Pinterest, was um, the one who was conducting the event. And they um, launched the PyG 2.0 um, library in that event. And they also presented some of the use cases um, in industry in how things relate with each other. And I was just wondering, have you um, used uh, the libraries in, in the previous times? And uh, what what do you think um, is the benefit uh, of using that um, tour, um, you know, in comparison with other libraries that are um, out there? Um, I assume that wasn't there um, when you were working at Uber Go. Um, because you talked about Deep Graph instead. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your familiarity with that. And uh, if you have, if you were a part of the event or do you know about that? Uh, so I I was not able to attend the complete event. Obviously, I wanted to uh, because of work of uh, work things. Uh, I, I was not able to attend the complete, but I attended some parts of it here and there. Uh, but I think one thing I'll say is like this: uh, in terms of libraries for graphs, and you're right. Like when back then, when I was trying to do it uh, in 2018, 19, there was I don't think there was any library, and I had to code entire thing from scratch in TensorFlow. Uh, on like the graph models or graph neural networks. While that was an interesting experience because you get to learn everything uh, that you kind of do uh, and not rely on any external library. But obviously it takes a lot of time and effort and then you have to work out scaling from yourself and more, more optimizations yourself, which are not available uh, in an open source manner. Um, but back in 2019, actually, I, I started to learn more about these two libraries which was like Python geometric by Matthias Fay was the main contributor there. Uh, I think PyG is also kind of extension towards that. I think um, Matthias Fay is the one who actually presented the um, workshop on its implementation. Um, I think it's in NTU Dortmund. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, he started back in 2009. I don't know, maybe when he started, but I think I started to look at it in 2019. Uh, it was very interesting because the kind of functions I was implementing myself 
right were already available that i can just plug in but one of the problems with that is that you know it's not available for tensorflow which is kind of sad because they're working on pytorch um instead you know it's um you can use the uh, existing pytorch code and then you know uh, use the graphical libraries to run the same code um so that i i guess that might be um a little disappointing for you but maybe you can use your code that you've already written uh, unless it's proprietary code yeah, I think the, the 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 thing that was happening at that one. So you're right. PyTorch geometric was obviously PyTorch, uh, and um, like uh, PyTorch was getting more popular and popular in 2019. But for for our purposes, we were using TensorFlow in our company at that time, or at least I was using TensorFlow a lot. Uh, but I think there was another library which is uh, Deep Graph library, uh, which was having I think both TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch support. Uh, uh, from uh, I think some Amazon developers uh, were kind of mainly contributing, but it's now open source also. Uh, so DGL.AI uh, was another library uh, which had both TensorFlow and PyTorch support, and I'm really excited about it um, because uh, for the reason that it's like built for more production grade things. Uh, exactly. So it has support for large graphs. It has support for other things uh, in general. Uh, and it was more production, like towards more production. And PyTorch geometry, at least at that time, I've not used it recently, uh, but PyTorch geometry, at least at that time, was more geared towards like latest models in research. And so it was more catering to researchers uh, at that time. So now I think now that might be changing a little bit, but that was the case. So I think for our fraud project, uh, when we started, like that was late 2019. Uh, so by that time, DGL was already available. So for our fraud project, we used DGL.ai uh, rather than uh, relational learning from DGL.ai rather than building everything from scratch for that purpose. So uh, my experience with overall libraries, I think has been great in terms of graph libraries. Um, I think uh, you can find the latest and greatest models very quickly uh, in those libraries, which is great. You can try it in one click uh, in some sense. Um, uh, at the same time, though, uh, if your graph is very large, you might have to customize some things in the libraries uh, because some some things are built more from a research focus perspective, but we're in the application settings. Uh, you might have to do more work to kind of get them out in production. But I think these two libraries are both great. Yeah, of course they are. Actually, I was talking to Matthias Fay, and you know, I proposed the same question to you also that um, there has been a serious rift between um, users' choice of deep learning um, libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Some people are, you know, ardent supporters of TensorFlow. Other people would write, or rather have PyTorch. And a lot of papers, research-oriented papers coming out of universities, they use PyTorch. Uh, for example, PyG 2.0 um, has also been the reason for 700 papers are written and that was the choice of the library. And I'm just wondering, do you have a personal favorite um, regardless of um, you know the industry um, and um, university um, rift or, and do you also in general think, because I personally think that there has to be some kind of bridging between these two, because you know that leaves a lot of people um, on one side of the framework and you know become kind of an Apple and Google uh, war um, in the frameworks as well. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I think obviously there is conflict of interest because I work at Facebook and PyTorch is from Facebook. Uh, so I, I, yeah, well, I let, let's not... you know detach you from your person, you know, a occupational attachment, and you talk to us about your personal uh, experience with these uh, libraries and not your institutional support. Yeah, I think uh, in my opinion, like obviously uh, things have changed a lot. Uh, um, so at least I'll talk about from the. From the previous works that I did, not, not, not the current work that I'm doing, uh, at least in back in 2019, I think uh, PyTorch was excellent for researchers at that time, and I think it was built for that, uh, more around, built more around that. Um, and TensorFlow at that time was trying to add more and more production stuff uh, on in terms of like, uh, like I think Tensor, like basically uh, TensorFlow extended and other things that were TensorFlow Edge uh, that was coming out that was more like, can we deploy on mobile? Can you do end-to-end -end system with TensorFlow Extended? So it was, I think, more around that. But I think now PyTorch has caught up in some sense. Uh, and also, I think it is also doing really well in terms of production grade stuff. Um, so I think for now, I think the differences uh, are much less as compared to back they were in 2019. So uh, at this point, I think, what you choose uh, also depends on your personal preference a little bit. Uh, and um, I think it really doesn't matter uh, as long as I think both the libraries are pretty much now 
getting similar things. Um, there are slight differences. I'll not talk about just details on that one. Um, but at this point, I think, um, yeah, I think there is not much difference like for research you use this or for, uh, or for um, applications you use this. At least at that time there was in 2019. I mean, in terms of memory optimization um, and efficient use of uh, matrix co computations, do you think which one is more scalable, um, PyTorch or, or TensorFlow, or are they at par um, in most tasks? I mean, I guess there should be a good research paper on this also that, you know, you take industrial grade model, then try to deploy it through different um, frameworks. But w what's your personal experience with that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think obviously it depends on hardware also on what you're training on. But I think both libraries are now in good yeah, Given shape we have the same that, uh, hardware. So I mean, what do you think you know, would perform best um, given everything else the same? Yeah, I think, uh, for, like, I think now, uh, more or less, I think they should be similar. I think there might be some advances that I'm not aware of. Um, but, but I think uh, from what I understand, uh, the performance wise, uh, not much difference uh, from what I know. Um, but at the same time, there might be new things uh, that might be coming out in some libraries, uh, which is hard to catch up generally all the time. Um, but I think from, from, my, my, from my perspective, I think they're both same. Yeah. And uh, have you personally tried um, PyG 2.0 or PyG at some point? Um, what, what are your, uh, what's your review on that? So PyG geometry, I've definitely tried. Uh, PyG 2.0, I have not tried because I think it is- Because that was really yesterday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think PyG 2.0 I'm not right, but I think PyTorch geometry I've tried a lot. Uh, and I can say that uh, when I was implementing Graph Sage uh, from scratch in TensorFlow versus when I tried to do it in now um, in, uh, in PyTorch geometry, uh, the iteration time is like uh, from few weeks to few, uh, like one or two days, essentially. And how big is um, the data set that you're talking about? Yeah, data set could be like, uh, large scale graph, you can have 100 million plus nodes and 100 million plus edges for sure. Uh, and for that also, I think uh, we have used, uh, we've we used PyTorch geometric a little bit. Uh, and, and I'll say that now I think the, the, the state, state of uh, the graph machine learning in that library uh, is quite good. And it can be like ready for more production grade style things also. So my review is like, obviously it's a great library. It helped me a lot. Like I gave me a perspective that if I just use library versus building everything from scratch, I just save so much time. So I think it has been great for researchers and I think it has great for practitioners also. Yeah, let's talk about your work um, at Facebook. Um, we know from a fact that, you know, when you were intern at Facebook, that was many, many years ago, you were working on a problem. Um, of finding uh, fun pages versus the authentic pages. Um, and that must have been fun. I'm just wondering, uh, since then, has your real role expanded a lot? Um, and, um, you know, what um, interesting projects have you been working on uh, lately? Yeah, um, so I think uh, when I was an intern, obviously, uh, um, I was given some fun project to work on in general. And I didn't have to do like a lot of operational stuff that comes with a full time job. Um, so I think that was just focused on one project at that time. Um, right now, I think I do a lot of things, uh, obviously, uh, uh, like researching or trying to kind of uh, add new models to the product I work on. Uh, so I work related to some integrity problems and other things. Um, I cannot talk much, but uh, overall, I'll say that uh, part of my job is to kind of uh, try to see if new models work out in this space or what kind of modeling implements we can make. But a good chunk of job is also tying uh, solutions to problems and scaling the solutions to Facebook data uh, so that we can uh, like get effective data, like how to label training data, how to get the in, uh, enough training data to kind of train a model and also deploy it at scale of Facebook uh, so that we can add real value to users. So I think my job right now is not only just try new machine learning models, but also making sure that uh, everything from end to end kind of works. Mm. So would that be a good characterization of um, and summarization of your work that you know you you're not only working on um, finding unique models um, that improve the metrics, but also finding an efficient way to collect data, to validate that data, uh, optimize that, um, and then you know end to end deploy the models and see if that's working. Is is that correct? 
yeah and basically the idea is to solve the problem uh, essentially in an application and for that if yeah if better model works then that's great uh, obviously most of the time that is a requirement uh, and if better data works that's also great uh, so we try to solve it in a manner that whatever it has the maximum value to the overall uh, business problem uh, we try to add that uh, as a thing uh, but at the same time we have to ensure that everything scales up to facebook scale uh, which also becomes sometimes a challenge in general i think it's a very interesting and broad uh, set of problems where you have to think about a lot of things um, and manage team who would actually make sure that um, not only is data collected um, and presented and transformed in a way that's understandable and efficient but also modeling and then you know deploying that uh, to make sure that it's working better than the model that we have deployed and i'm just wondering how do you manage this whole life cycle um for different applications it's kind of more of a debugging um um kind of role that i think that is um i'm sure that you cannot um talk exactly about what you're doing but you know uh, what entails um i mean what does your job look like every day yeah i think my uh, like pretty much the work i do every day is like either uh, i am thinking about what next to try in the problem so that we can improve the accuracy further uh, or sometimes i spend more, some time in talking to my cross function partners uh because i work in a central team which works with any product teams like more facebook instagram oculus and other things uh so i'm trying to unpack with cross functional partners to kind of understand the problems uh and maybe change the solution accordingly so that we can actually solve the problem uh, for them uh so be it like uh, you can say a news feed or you can say people you may know uh or something else uh, that we work on on instagram recommendations or something like that so what we try to do is we try to collect like so some of my time is spent on understanding the like you can say product requirements um some of my time is spent on uh like what kind of new models we can try or new kind of techniques we can try for the team and some of the time is like i sometimes code myself or also i can i help guide some junior members in the team uh to kind of um, how to bet uh, how to make the models better or how to develop an effective pipeline so that we can run the models at scale so it depends on what kind of day it is but you can say sometimes on meetings uh, to just understand the problem and frame the problem uh, sometimes your own focus work in terms of like building a new idea or proposing a new idea or uh, executing on the current idea that we have and also sometimes spent on like mentoring people or helping out junior members in the team to kind of contribute to the problem I think uh, Facebook is one of the most helpful um companies when it comes to research that we in our company has benefited from because we do a lot of demographic and psychographic work and the tools that Facebook actually use to recommend uh, you know the people that you know or the pages that you might like or the groups that you would be interested in that's such a fantastic technology and coming from my own behavioral science and psychology background I find it really interesting to read um you know Facebook algorithms that um that are that learn the the representations of different customers and their behaviors on like online on the platform and i was just wondering it's it's a very different problem when you have multiple uh metaverse um application like whatsapp um instagram messenger um facebook and do you must have a lot of multimodal data and i'm just wondering like we were talking before how do you actually use um you know, graph representation learning to solve the problem of this multimodal data i mean i guess in uber you probably had um some kind of restraint on what kind of data you would have and and how you could use that but i think in facebook is a lot bigger platform and if you could explain how do you extract um this multimodal data and uh, you know take insights from that and then make it in a prediction that customers would really like like friends you know or groups you know or you like yeah i think the idea there is so i obviously uh, i think there is some uh, content understanding teams uh, which try to understand multimodal content i don't work specifically that area right now uh, at the same time though uh, what happens in facebook is like keep like some some core teams will let's say who are working on content understanding will kind of publish the embeddings you can say uh, or learned representations uh, to for overall company to use uh, in a privacy aware manner obviously um so then what we do is like when we are working in the products uh, essentially or i'm building a model uh, and i'm building a let's say graph neural network 
uh, I'll use those representations as a user preference in my node or edge features uh, and try to build a model accordingly. Um, so I think the major idea uh, here is that um, you can see uh, some subset of teams uh, mainly focus on getting the best content understanding done, which is like multimodal. Uh, and you can have long form videos, short form videos, which is Instagram Reels. Uh, you can have text, you can have just user clicks, likes, and others, right? Uh, and, and basically, uh, some teams are trying to learn the understanding of preferences, and then uh, other teams basically use that uh, initial understanding or representations in their own models to see how the uh, overall product impact us. So yeah, I think that's the process uh, at Facebook right now. I think one of the most interesting tools um, at Facebook that I have found is the Facebook Insights tool where you could actually go and you know, select the demographics um, of your, uh, of everyone on the Facebook. And then um, you can select a geography and it's going to tell you the pages that uh, these people from this demo uh, demography actually like a lot. And then you can elicit some kind of information about what people are um, looking at um, on the Facebook. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, I was recently reviewing and actually shared it on my um, LinkedIn also, uh, a paper at Spotify in 2014, I believe, where they actually took sounds like songs and then they converted it into a graphical representation and then they matched it with a user's listener profile. And the breakthrough was that, you know, before that they would simply use Bayesian data uh, for customer behavior uh, before um, on Spotify. And what they did was that instead of actually using only the historical data, they converted the song into a, a matrix uh, form and they also converted the customer preference into a matrix form and then actually combined that. Because one of the problems uh, which would happen with the new songs is called the cold start problem where you have a um, mm -hmm. song and you have no idea uh, which category or which people would like it. So instead of you know, matching it randomly with people to find out they would like it, they would just simply um, represent the song as the graphical representation and then you know, match it with other graphic representation of the song that are already on the platform and it turned out to be a huge hit. And I'm just wondering if Facebook is doing something like that. Yeah, I think that goes to the uh, part on similar content uh, on Facebook, you can say. Uh, and I think what you're talking about is similar songs on Spotify. Uh, and like for other companies, I can tell you like Pinterest has similar pins, uh, for example, uh, which is exactly the concept or maybe in YouTube, there is a similar videos uh, actually. And that might be the case. So all those ideas pretty much are, are born out by simple thing that um, can we learn a graph based. Uh, so graph based is one technique. There might be other techniques also, but uh, can we learn a graph based uh, representations of that particular uh, particular video or particular content or a particular user for that matter, right? Uh, which basically is in the same latent space as other uh, contents. Now, when you have something like this, then you can do the dot products uh, of two latent representation or two vector basically, and see if they are similar or not. Like ideally dot product should measure the cosine of things. And if they are very similar to each other, then the dot product should be one. Uh, and if they are very dissimilar to each other, dot product should be zero. So the, what the people do is like to recommend similar content, uh, they kind of take this dot product at scale, which is K nearest neighbors also people call it, uh, which is like they take dot products with that still and then try to kind of rank the similar videos or similar content or even similar users for that matter and recommend those uh, in, 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 in the final recommendation system. So this kind of thing is used both for retrieval in terms of candidate generation, you can say in the recommendation system. And this kind of thing is also used in, uh, in ranking uh, of, uh, of those contents. So I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much the basic idea. I think what Spotify is doing, maybe what other companies are doing and maybe what Facebook is also doing. I think your um, 2019 Neo IPS um, submission um, was very interesting in that regard, where you um, talk about Metagraph, which is the future link prediction via meta learning. It, uh, let's talk about uh, that paper and uh, you know what problem did that solve? And you know, do you think that that might be relevant um, in this context? Uh, yes, in some sense, but not exactly. So I'll tell you why, uh, how we came out this idea, first of all, and then we'll talk about a little bit on the technical side. Uh, the idea was that uh, if you think about Uber, uh, Uber was in many cities. So even Uber Eats was 
San Francisco, LA, Seattle, and other countries around the world. Um, but what we were doing was essentially we are learning a model per city. Uh, so if there are hundreds of cities, you're modeling uh, hundreds of models essentially, which is obviously hard to scale. Uh, if you think about it, if you, Uber keeps on increasing the number of cities and the number of uh, models keep on increasing. And also for some cities that are very small, the data is not huge or the Uber products are not used much, you don't get any good model at all. The idea was here that uh, can we learn one model, let's say one global model, and then just customize that model to different cities. Uh, maybe fine tune it for some time uh, to San Francisco, LA, Seattle, and then some things. So rather than learning one specific model for each city, which is like more compute intensive, let's learn one global model, right? Uh, and um, try to kind of in uh, like like few short in a few short manner try to learn a model per city. So in this case, the models were graph models. And at that time, there was not much, there was research on meta learning using images and using text and other things. There was very, very uh, less research on using meta learning for graphs. Uh, and what we were dealing with, like for Uberish was a graphical data. Um, so at that time, we kind of thought about this idea uh, on uh, like using meta learning on graphs, which was essentially like if you uh, read Chelsea Finn's paper on like, um, Meta learning using gradients. Uh, um, the idea was that you learn one global model and then you customize the model for each particular thing. So in our case, I think the paper talks about a set of graphs, which is obviously on more in public domain is like protein protein interaction graphs, uh, where we kind of learn one model. So protein protein interaction graphs are like what are caused in like in molecules in some sense, right? So you have one protein structure and another protein structure. And then you have a third protein structure. Rather than learning model for every protein structure, you learn one global model and adapt to that protein structure. I think that was the idea uh, in the data sets used in the paper. So the core idea, uh, we just uh, uh, applied from initial meta learning uh, papers on like using for images and adapted it for uh, the graph data. Uh, and we were trying to kind of learn a global model and adapt to uh, different other graphs. Um, actually, that worked uh, really well. Uh, at my time at Uber, uh, we were trying to implement this idea also uh, in our products so that we can optimize the amount of compute we needed. Uh, and we were seeing good some good savings, but uh, I think the the model at that till the time I was there, it was not completely done. And maybe people have done it now, uh, which I'm not aware of. I think it's a very great um, attempt uh, towards the. Um, optimization of how we view these um, large um, scale data set problems. Um, but let's talk about something else. Um, Master of Skills uh, is such a wonderful podcast by Reid Hoffman. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and he talked to Mark Zuckerberg about um, the culture at Facebook um, experimentation. And what he talks about is that, you know, if there if there's an engineer who wants to um, experiment um, a certain feature um, on the data set um, on Facebook. You know, they're given 10,000 people um, after the approval of manager to find out uh, if that idea works. And if it works, you know, they're going to scale it to the other deployments. And I'm just wondering if that has your, been, uh, has your, been, uh, has your experience and uh, what are some of the pros um, working for Facebook? Um, and we're going to be coming towards cons also, but let's start here. Yeah, I think I can only speak uh, from my experience in this case. Uh, and I think uh, from my experience, so the pros is definitely the data, I would say for a data person like me, uh, I think that is like um, like a gold mine of data, if I may say so, um, uh, which is good. Uh, and obviously now uh, Facebook has a lot of focus on using pri on privacy, um, which we, we can, we only use the data which is more privacy aware. Uh, and even, even if the privacy aware data, I think the data is quite huge. And that gives you uh, as a machine learning person, a lot of leeway in trying to apply uh, new techniques and try to improve the overall thing. So data is like, if you have a garbage in garbage out problem in machine learning, uh, nothing will happen even if you apply fancy techniques. So in that sense, um, the data at Facebook is like the biggest uh, thing that I find as a pro uh, for a person like me who works in the data field. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's the major part. And obviously there are great colleagues. Um, I, I find the culture also very good from my perspective uh, in terms of collaboration and other things. So I think those are other things also that I uh, enjoy working at Facebook on. 
And what are, what are the things um, that you don't like working on Facebook and, you know, uh, why people switch to other companies? Not in a bad sense, it's just like, you know, the, um, the opportunity cost. Yeah, I think uh, uh, many a times, I think, in, I think that's not specific to Facebook. I'll just talk about any large company, right? Uber was, even if it's large, it's much smaller, but much smaller than Google or Facebook. Uh, actually, and in very large companies, what happens is like uh, many a times, um, many a times the problem you are working on is a very small subset of the overall part uh, and which obviously uh, some people might not enjoy uh, because now you have to give, you go deep into that one specific focus problem but some people might enjoy like in a smaller company you can own a bigger problem uh, overall um, so I think that is obviously a, a, you can not say a con but some, some facet of working at a very large scale tech company uh, that you don't sometimes have the liberty to kind of have all the things in your control. And there are several sub teams working on the similar problems in different parts. Um, so I think that's how uh, I would think about as, as a, a large scale tech company, not a con, but another facet that um, people might not enjoy. And that's why they switch to maybe smaller companies or other companies for that matter. Um, there's always one teacher that inspires um, us a lot. Um, who was that teacher for you? Yeah, I would always say uh, it was uh, uh, my teacher in uh, school uh, up till 10th standard who made me love math. Uh, I think she did a great job uh, in overall teaching me mathematics. Uh, and I think from my love for mathematics have brought me to this field uh, eventually and which has become my career. So I'm very grateful uh, for all the teachers actually, but obviously the, my teacher at high, in high school for the mathematics, uh, I think was the, like, I think one of the greatest uh, uh, experiences I have, which kind of brought me to the field. I think there are a lot of, you know, unsung heroes who actually create heroes. It's kind of, they're the king makers. And I remember my own teachers um, in school who were very down to earth and they didn't get mentioned uh, in a lot of places. Um, instead, there are students like you, um, you know, shared the stage, but it's very important that, you know, we highlight these people um, who, engender the love of and the subject and a wonderful way of explaining this. And I think um, you were kind of paying back in your own way. You were leading an um, engineer education circle at Uber. Um, and you also mentored a lot of people. Um, you did some mentoring at uh, Springboard. We'll talk a little bit about your own efforts of you know, expanding your experiences to other people who might not otherwise be able to um, have access to great resources and engineers. Yeah, I think uh, I've always believed and I think uh, that education is a game changer uh, in someone's life. At least for me, it was. Uh, and I think, uh, and for people uh, uh, also, I think that it's like, if you have an education, it's knowledge is power. Uh, and I think that can be a game changer in your life and overall society. And for that reason, I am also enamored, like just by the pursuit of teaching things. Uh, and I love teaching. Uh, so if I get more time, I like what will I do if I leave my job? I'll just start to teach something, uh, essentially. So um, and I think teaching works both ways. And I personally feel that people get like the students that I teach obviously get more knowledge out of it. I get to learn the subject much better uh, when I teach uh, sometimes, and that's why I also love teaching at some level. So it's somewhat selfish, also you can say, but at the same time, I love giving back in that sense. Uh, my experience has been great, so I always uh, wanted to teach some uh, in some some things. And the uh, easiest for me to teach was uh, the thing I work on, which is data science and machine learning. Uh, and for that reason, I engaged with a lot of boot camps uh, and also um, like just basically giving either one-on-one -on -one lectures or sometimes uh, mentoring people uh, into their careers uh, on data science and also. Uh, teaching a full-fledged course, like in General Assembly I did um, in US, um, which was like a full-fledged course on just machine learning and data science at that time. At the same time though, uh, uh, I, in my effort at Uber, we call this at AIversity at Uber, which I thought that uh, there was nothing like teaching. So we were like, AI Labs was machine learning people all, right? Um, and we were like uh, researchers in all machine learning, but the rest, of the rest of the company was not, and AI could have huge impact on the company. While one way is to build tools so that people can use it, uh, another way is to let them people know what this technology is all about. And at 
at, like now i think it's making getting more and more stream mainstream but few years back people were still discussing what is data science and ai uh, so i started this initiative uh, where we used to teach like different uh, new machine learning techniques like graph learning was one uh, i used to teach and then we taught green personal learning we taught nlp uh, to all the engineers like i think uh, i think we covered more than uh, 1500 engineers uh, approximately who had touched our courses in one way or the other uh, and that was just uh, like there was volunteer led initiative uh, which was also great to see uh, and i think it made a huge impact in overall ecosystem of machine learning at uber and i'm also involved in similar efforts at now facebook but facebook is more mature they already have a program established um, so i'm trying to contribute towards that program then directly start it Have you also considered writing a book about um, graph um, learning? You already have a book on TensorFlow machine um, learning projects, but um, I guess uh, most of your work is on um, graph learning, is, and that would make um, such a fantastic um, read based on your experiences in um, Uber and Facebook. Um, so, is that uh, somewhere in the pipeline? Yeah, I think I'm uh, trying to more uh, like get time to start a blog on that first. uh then uh, write a book because writing a book from my experience i obviously it's a, it's a great thing everyone should take up once uh, at least uh, but it also takes up a lot of time uh, like uh, for one entire year i was just basically all the weekends were spent on just writing that book essentially uh, which is i think a huge commitment uh, which uh, like i i will take up as in when i get more and more time but what i'm aiming for to do right now is like Uh, start a blog post i i anyway read a lot of research coming out on the graph side uh, so i'll start a blog post on uh, just sharing the knowledge so that people are also aware uh, on what is happening on this area um, so i think that's one of my next steps uh, that i'll take potentially maybe you can you know ha- uh, approach this problem in discrete steps and you know start a medium blog and you know keep posting and you know, then um, combine it together into some kind of book or something because i personally think that would make such a wonderful read um uh, when it comes to graph learning especially with your practical experiences on you know how you put um all different nodes and edges together and you know what was the um implementation details and your work on facebook um so that would be um, something great yeah sure i think yeah that's a good idea i'll also take a look in terms of like turning my medium blog post into book i think yeah that's fair I think you also had uh, some of very um, unique and um, grotesque experiences of life that you can teach uh, apart from your subject, um, which is math. Um, your work as Slumberger uh, was a very interesting one. I mean, how does an electrical engineer end up uh, in the middle of an ocean on an oil rig? Yeah, I think uh, it was very interesting because as a 22-year-old graduating from college, you don't know what you want. and i think that was me at that time um so the most interesting question uh, probably is that you are an electrical engineer i would i was expecting a chemical engineer to be on the rig because i have some friends um working in gulf or on the oil rigs what were you doing there yeah um so i think uh, for slum budget the hiring was not like you know, uh, this engineer versus that engineer any engineer who wants to join and can clear the interview during the placement season we had at iit bombay uh actually was ready to join and i and i think um, at that time like um, my um, i was not sure that i wanted to do statistics or math like obviously as a 22 year old you think you like it but you don't know whether you'll do it uh, for a long period of time or not um so because of that and i also i think uh, um, in my time um, like as a 22 year old you don't realize you go after who are pays you the most at that time which is i eventually realize it's not the right thing to do Uh, but at that time i just went ahead who were get me the most paying job and that was slumberger at that time um, which i would not advise anybody listening to this uh, that uh, take up a job just for uh, the pay even if you are just graduating from college uh, i did that and i think uh, uh, what i realized was while the experience was great it was a very unique experience going to rig sites and working in a very high pressure environments uh, in a very different kind of people that you have worked with any time in your life and also gives you massive perspective when you kind of stay away from your usual like day to day city life and in the middle of the ocean uh, you get to think about your own preferences much better as what i realized um, where were you deployed so of, yeah i was deployed in multiple places uh, like mostly on mumbai high which is like a uh, like um, 
the ocean side of or sea side of Mumbai, you can see, right, uh, a port. Uh, and some parts I was deployed somewhere in East India, a uh, little bit, um, some parts in like uh, Dubai, Oman kind of thing also. Um, so, so I think uh, like there were different places that I went to, uh, which was a living out of a suitcase life because every time you are just traveling with your gear and everything uh, to a new rig site uh, in a chopper. So while all those things were exciting at the first, uh, I eventually realized that that's not what I want to do uh, with my preferences in my life. Um, so I wanted to go back to stats and math, which I always loved. Uh, and I think that experience made me realize that that is what I wanted to do essentially. Um, so, so I think that's how, uh, that's how the switch came to masters to UC Berkeley uh, from uh, Shlambaje. But overall, I think the company is great. It treats you very well. The people are nice, uh, but it was just not for me in terms of what I wanted out to do uh, with, my, with my time, essentially. Okay, um, let's get back to your work and talk a little about um, the industry direction in general. Um, and for that reason, you know, you can um, um, cut off your association, association with Facebook right here. Um, let's talk about the general directions uh, of AI. Um, I mean, you probably are wor working on a division of uh, Jan LeCun, um, who's been a legendary um, figure in um, AI and a lot of interesting views and predictions coming from him. Some work, some don't work. And I was just wondering, uh, there's been a recent uh, outcry um, against the applications of AI, which would be categorized um, in in some ways unethical realm. And I was just wondering, are is, is the promises made by AI you know, an overkill? Um, is it um, glamorized way more than um, it really has to offer? Um, and generally, do we, are we in the right direction when it comes to AI? Hmm. Uh, I think, uh, I think that there's obviously some hype cycle around AI, there's no doubt about it. Um, and I think, uh, uh, like I think people overestimate some can like some initial results uh, a lot more. I think when I, I think this uh, this project from OpenAI on uh, like code generation I forgot the name uh, that came out recently. Um, I think people were like very excited about it, which is the right thing to do. But obviously, uh, it doesn't solve everything. There are always flaws with AI that people have to realize. So I think that hype cycle because of media that is created is not perfectly right way. There's still a lot more work to be done for AI to be applicable. Even if you think about self-driving cars, right? L5, achieving L5, uh, uh, like it's nowhere close to that. Even if you see some videos where the car is driving uh, itself. So there are a lot of edge cases that are not handled even by Tesla today or some other companies today. So there's still a lot of challenges in making AI work in your everyday life. At the same time, uh, there are two aspects I see. One is uh, AI will, at, for many application, AI will get there. Like I think L5 also, in my understanding at least, L5 will also be achieved at some point in the next 10 to 20 years, if not in the next two years. Um, so I think some of the problems that we see today, uh, because a lot of people are working on it, and I think the technology is developed at rapid, rapid pace, uh, I think those problems will be solved. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, uh, there will always be a conversation, and it's very hard to take a stand on this uh, in terms of where ethics and responsible AI will come into play uh, in something like this. I think there is a lot of work going on in terms of like um, like optimizing your objective functions, so overall people happiness, right? Now, how do you measure happiness? Like it's a very abstract concept. I think Kai Fu Lee in his book also talks about this a little bit. Uh, like, is it like like money is a thing you can measure, right? How much There's actually a happiness budget. index, uh, you know, published in which all the Canadian countries are on top. Uh, I don't know why I've lived there and they're not the happiest for sure. But maybe it has to do with the GDP. Uh, but you're right, you know, it's a very hard problem. Yeah, uh, I, think, uh, I think tuning your objective function from what people might like, something like that, to the long-term way, on like how people will perceive this or how this will affect their life in a long-term way. Uh, I think that's the shift uh, that has to take place uh, for like for AI to benefit the society at large. Um, so we have to think, shift the thinking from the short term, whether this image is a cat or a dog, like which is also right thing to do, 
but I think more towards like how much uh, like showing this content to people or like having this content to people uh, can help them drive eventual happiness in 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 long uh, time to come. Now the problem is hard because there's obviously some happiness index that you talked about, which is right, uh, but it's very hard to measure what is the right way to kind of think about happiness. Like what kind of measure, like maybe endorph endomorphins that you have in the body, maybe there's those things you can measure, right? You can have measure the money you have, uh, maybe that thing you can measure. But so you have, people have to come, like I don't know the answer here, but I think people have to come up with the innovative ways on measuring this long-term thing rather than a short-term thing. And I think that's where, uh, people are trying to take AI towards also. Uh, and I think that's the right direction to take in my opinion. So, but I don't know the solution, but I think that's the, uh, that's the way it is going. I think it's a very interesting debate because, you know, I have um, so many neuroscientists and psychologists come on my show and we talked about the fact that, you know, AI might be able to help you live longer. But do you really want to live longer? Because, you know, you have to spend that life in a way that's meaningful and productive and self-satisfying and you can live to the best of your ability. And we're not too sure that that's happening because if you look at the psychological indicators in clinical psychology, you know, things are getting worse. You know, people are uh, becoming more and more anxious. Depression is the largest cause of workplace disability. Suicides are on the rise. Um, you know, young um, children, for example, uh, from 2012 onwards, um, I think the rate for cutting up their um, bodies in younger um, girls is on the rise um, and it has quadrupled, unfortunately. So it's kind of questions the whole model of, is it really helping? And one of the way, a question that I wanted to put you is that, you know, how AI is, just, AI is transforming society is probably the bigger questions um, and not the question if it's making our life easier. But easier is certainly something that's, uh, quantitative and the happier is probably a question which is more qualitative and does it bother you really um working for an organization that's been accused for uh, several alarming things um manipulating election um results right of politicizations polarization advertising um and you know getting intimate details by people and not actually taking care of that and you know, some of the dumps have been found on the internet and, and i do know that you know you're not directly responsible for that but i think at some point um bother you and do, do you have some suggestions for how it can be ameliorated yeah i think obviously uh like i cannot comment more on that but from my perspective i think one thing i find is like uh the company is trying to do the right thing uh, what is right thing is quite subjective at times, uh, but company doesn't, like from my experience at least, and uh, that is not talking in any association with Facebook, but from my experience at least, uh, the company is trying, has a heart in its right place and is trying to do the right thing uh, for people. Now, uh, uh, obviously because of the, uh, because of so much, um, like so much things that are generated and everything else, uh, there will always be things that are not getting right. Um, but I think uh, overall the company is trying to make it everything right um, in best possible manner. Do you also think it has to do something with the Facebook's um, ad revenue model? Um, because it's a bit of a trolley problem. I agree with you. You know, do you um, keep the company rolling and running and, and profitable, or do you um, actually? you know, not engage in any kind of commerce um, based on ads, because it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, mutually exclusive question. Uh, for example, Facebook has acquired over 78 companies in the past and done not including the private acquisitions. Um, and that includes one of the biggest uh, platforms like Instagram, WhatsApp, um, Oculus VR. And now we're talking about Metaverse, um, which has been uh, one of the probably prolific uh, results out of the Facebook Apple uh, spat. Um, and I was just wondering, do you have any views on um, the model um, that Facebook has um, acquired uh, for um, its profitability, which is the ad revenue model instead of, you know, the product-based model, which Apple has? Yeah, I think it's just two different uh, revenue models. Uh, and I think it's apples and oranges comparison, not exactly the same because the businesses are very different. Um, no, I guess my argument also... was that, you know, is it the model that's actually... Uh, that that's the reason why Facebook is accused way more than Apple, uh, because you know it has to be uh, profitable based on the ads and not on the products. Yeah, I think uh, I would I would say it like this: that Apple builds product for a niche set of people, 
which is like not everyone in my country of India can afford iPhone. Um, so I think it builds uh, products for a niche set of people versus Facebook for that matter builds the products for everyone, right? So it doesn't vary by income levels or um, any other levels for that matter. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, yes, if you are uh, targeting more people than what Apple is targeting on, uh, there is bound to be more like pickups also uh, as compared to uh, the other company um, actually. At the same time, I, I personally think that um, like there's a lot of things that are talked about ads. Like from my personal experience, ads have been helpful also because it gives you sometimes the, the thing that you want to buy or something like that. And the best possible thing is in front of you in your ads, uh, which you don't get it. Like if you just uh, do some searching and try to navigate tens of pages. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, like uh, I, I know that there is some, some talks about ads uh, in general, um, but I think from my experience also, it has been helpful in trying to get to the right product uh, very quickly. And I think you're very right with this because a lot of people have um, these concerns about ads. And one of the things that I talked to them about is that, you know, they're not as necessarily evil. It's just like they make their job easier. It's just like when they use your data to actually use something else without your permission, it is, is a problem. Uh, but ads themselves are not evil um, in itself. I mean, this is how Google came into place. You know, they're basically giving you ads about the things that you're looking for. So it's just a search engine. Um, Apple also, you know, when they uh, when you go to App Store, they give you right apps based on your keywords. Um, that's also one form of you know furnishing ads. It's just not. It's just like a recommender system a recommender system that gives you the things that you really want. Um, some people profit from it and some not, depending on their model, but it necessarily is not the bad thing. But let's talk a little bit about metaverse. Um, you know, the reliance on the online platform of Facebook uh, is probably not the best thing uh, for the future um, as it is put by Mark Zuckerberg, especially after this Apple spat, where they realized that, you know, ha having a service uh, base model is probably not enough. Uh, what do you think about Metaverse? Um, how is that going to play out? Um, is it going to be um, a successful model? Uh, any views on, at all? Yeah, I think it's obviously a long-term thing. Uh, so it's very hard to predict at this point. Uh, my my understanding is that as the, like one thing COVID has realized us that the world might move digital much quicker than what it was back in 2019. Uh, so I think with the advent of more digital things, you require more di di digital tools uh, in some sense. Uh, like, uh, um, and then there are experiences that you can build uh, in digital world uh, that, that are more representative of what you see in real life also. Um, I, so in my opinion, I think uh, metaverse is an interesting concept. And I think uh, more and more things would be tried in that. Um, and there are some interesting things that you might read about what Facebook is trying to work on, right? Be it in terms of like what Oculus is there and in what, like I think recently released Ray-Ban stories. Um, they're all part of the thing that uh, hardware, which are kind of move towards more on metaverse thing. How much it is going to be uh, successful? I don't know. I'm not the right but person is it, to say that. But can you see the connection between the previous question and this? Are they're trying to get into the hardware space so that they don't have to rely on Apple? But do you think that that's that's the direction that they're taking? Yeah. Um, so I think, um, like, I think the the I think the direction, in my opinion, is like where world is moving more towards, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I think the world is moving more towards these digital experiences or digital. Um, experience, uh, like in the sense of like digital experience that's akin to real life. Uh, I, and I think that's what Facebook is trying to move. So I don't know if that is only because it relies on ads model or something, um, um, but I think that's where the world is moving anyway. So I think uh, they are also trying to invest in that effort. Let's talk about Ray-Ban stories, such a fascinating concept. You know, you can take a picture uh, just by pressing a button on um, the Ray-Ban that you're wearing. Um, it still doesn't have the AR included in that um, to an extent where it would actually replace the need for having a cell phone um, or a computer screen, but such a fantastic um, development. However, this is not the first time any company has done that. Uh, Google already had a smart um, glasses um, concept going on forward, but it doesn't have the traction um, in the market, like it, like it would actually take over the mobile and uh, smart 
uh, and the desktop versions. Uh, how do you think um, that's going to play out? Yeah, I think uh, I can talk about from my experience. I'm not involved in the development of Ray-Ban stories in any sense. Um, but I can tell you from my experience, uh, it feels more like a like a, like a goggles, like basically, than uh, than a, than a specialized uh, than a specialized hardware for uh, taking photos or something like the Google Glass Plus. When I felt I used it, so it it's more more feels more natural spectacles, right, as compared to. Uh, like Google Glass, which was like more of a hardware that I will wear to kind of take photos uh, than what the spectacles will look like. So I think the change uh, in terms of like you do it in what you what you do you do what you do your in your everyday life, which is like wear spectacles uh, going out and everything else, and that's the same thing you'll do with Ray-Ban stories uh, as compared to um, like uh, Google Glass, which was I think a different hardware. So I think that uh, shifts, uh, at least from my experience, uh, is a great thing that a company has done uh, in general in terms of like building something which is like more commonly used anyway. Would you like to take um, calls and answer calls um, on your glasses? Because that's something that we don't have a mental framework for. Um, so for example, if you're wearing glasses and you have or all of a sudden a picture of uh, the person who's calling you and you take this and it's you don't see the road anymore and you know you're kind of blinded um, by the real um environment you are in um do you really think that people will eventually get to that frame of mind where it's okay to take calls on your glasses uh, especially coming from the mobile and uh, desktop environment yeah uh, calls i think is fine like you have a bluetooth uh like on what like, about video uh, calls bluetooth. Video calls, I don't know. Like, I think uh, I don't know if they have it also or not. I'm I've not used it that way, um, but uh, um, but I think video calls. I don't know what will happen on that one. Uh, I like obviously there are some issues that when you are driving you don't want to take that. Um, but I think that's the same case with the phone also in some sense. So you can avoid that when you're getting a video call on the phone on when you're sitting in the car. Uh, but I think audio calls is fine. That is same as what you would do with any Bluetooth device. I think well, one of the interesting applications from the machine learning perspective is that you might be able to respond to a text message by dictating the message um, using the OS, whatever OS and there would be on those Ray-Bans. I, I know for sure Apple um, Mac OS wouldn't be that, um, but you know, then it also gives you um, an opportunity to develop a new one uh, for those classes and eventually um, for the phones also. Do you also think that at some point Facebook is going to be entering that market as well? Yeah, I don't know. I cannot comment on that, obviously. But how would you like uh, to see that happen? What would, what would a Facebook OS look like? I think it would be just catering to the hardware we have so that we can run it more efficiently, everything, uh, the applications we have. I think this is similar to what you would do in machine learning as an ASIC uh, chip design, which let's say uh, a chip just works for only self-driving versus uh, um, like I think some hardware, some, some specialized or software or hardware, which works only for this metaverse style applications. So I think that's, it's just, I think it will make things more faster, much more um, cleaner in some sense, uh, and maybe lighter also when you're talking about hardware that you have to wear. Um, so I think all of those things, uh, like very specific things will kind of add to the overall experience is what I believe. Don't you think that all the things that we're talking about and kind of gives, um, um as a deductive lesson that Facebook, you know, follows the typical Silicon Valley model of, you know, moving fast, breaking things, trying everything possible out there. Um, they also announced a Libra coin. I don't know how far that is um, in the production or um, let's say uh, the market rollout. But but do you think that's generally what Facebook is doing and some of that works and some, what, some just simply doesn't? Yeah, I think there are always many experiments running in the company. I think, uh, I think people hear about some things outside but there are always many experiments running in the company. And I think that's the case with, I would say, any big tech company because uh, the cost of experimentation is not that high. Like you don't have to set up a factory kind of to experiment something uh, just that, right? Uh, at least in the software side, uh, the cost of experimentation is very less. And because it's very less, you can experiment much faster. So that's how move fast and break things, uh, which is like, you can try things much faster, try to see if it works, doesn't work, uh, then let's get to the another idea. 
uh, I, I think that's a culture inside which I really like uh, that I can try something that I don't have, I have to seek permission exactly uh, and uh, and see if it works. If it works, we'll kind of scale it. If it doesn't work, then we'll move to something else. And why do you think Facebook actually beat the Google Orkut? Um, I'm sure that you're familiar with um, the social network that Google launched called Orkut. Okay, yeah, or Orkut, yeah. Um, so, um, so Facebook beat. Um, so I think I think one was uh, I think I'll tell from my experience uh, is like why I preferred Facebook over Orkut when I was trying to use it. Uh, it was uh, I think the newsfeed was much easier to use. And I think for Orkut, you have to go to someone's profile and then message and maybe then read their message. Uh, so there was nothing like news at that time. Uh, for me, I think that changed the game uh, personally. I think one of the interesting uh, then, thing is that I don't know if you noticed that because at back then, Facebook wasn't doing anything new. You know, their news groups were already there. Um, MIRC was already there. People had Usenet. Uh, people had email lists. Everything was there. The communication paradigm wasn't um, new. And I was just wondering, uh, was it only the technology? Because from my perspective, I only remember, um, like you just said, that Facebook was faster to load with news feed. And that has to do with Ajax and you know asynchronous loading um, of text within the feed. And that might be the only thing that got off, gotten, uh, probably have gotten people hooked. Uh, but do you think that technology was the only piece that got Facebook um, you know, outsmart every else, everyone else uh, in the realm? Um. There might be others, but I think Facebook, I think also I, I feel that it was more aggressive in trying to expand uh, as compared to, so it's sometimes the speed it also matters in this kind of settings, like because social network ultimately is about people. And if you have more people who you know are on one platform, then you can just join that platform and be part of it, right? So the value of each incremental member increases the overall network value uh, that you have. So I think, uh, I, I think the the strategy. Um, so I don't know how the uh, how the competition played out in uh, in details, uh, but I think the the strategy that Facebook took was I think more aggressive in terms of expansion and was more focused on that particular problem uh, as compared to other companies. So I think maybe that helped. Uh, at the same time, I, I I can see that the experience for me when I logged on to Orkut and Facebook, Facebook was much easier and much better. Uh, and also it was starting to get more and more people overall. So yeah, I think it, that's how uh, the Facebook won over Orkut. Uh, but again, I don't have details. I don't, I, I don't know much about it. Yeah, yeah, it's just fine you know, you qualify the question based on your own experience. Um, let's get to one of the questions that I'm very happy to um, ask um, always when it comes to that, because, you know, I got a... Uh, I got a lot of messages um, and emails about where to start, uh, start with data science, and I'd rather answer someone else, and especially if, uh, someone like you who has made it um, into the field quite far. Um, a lot of people think that you know you have to be uh, a STEM student to be able to do that. Um, is that a, a pre-qualification? Is that a requirement to get into data science? Uh, what does a data science career look like? Or what kind of people would be interested in joining that and should join that. Let's give us a little bit of um, starter on um, what the field is and what it takes to get into that. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think like people talk talk about this and ask me a lot of times also this thing. Uh, and I think people a lot of times talk about degrees on in some sense. Uh, I personally think like back then when I started uh, in 2013, 14, yeah, I think degrees were a requirement in my sense because they were not like the internet was not there yet in terms of like online resources and online coaching uh, or learning, you might say. Um, but uh, but but at that time, yes, I did that path. But if I were to do it today, I would not take a degree. Like I would just use internet as my friend, I build on internet, learn from internet, share on internet. Uh, and, and I think that's the best way to kind of go about things, at least from a data science perspective. Now, whether a uh, particular background matters, uh, I would say no. Like I've seen people from music learn bachelors in music are doing machine learning now. Uh, so I think everything can be learned uh, in these days with the kind of resources you have available. So I don't, obviously it takes more time. If you have a background, it will take less time. If you have no, don't have a background, it will take more time. Uh, I think that time is different. Uh, at the same time, can you do it? And can you get a job uh, if you if you are inclined to get that? Yes, I think the demand of the field is high. The field is growing very quickly, uh, and I think if you are putting 
some hours to learn, uh, you can eventually land in the field and have a career in the field. So I think that's the first uh, thing I'll say. Uh, in terms of like how to go about this, uh, I, as I said, um, try to learn, make internet your friend, uh, get out there and be involved a little bit. Uh, reach out to people who might you seek help with you know, on internet. I think you'll be surprised in general, like people will be surprised that how many people are willing to help to make them succeed. Uh, and I think I have experienced that personally and I would advise to kind of uh, go towards that path Path uh, like if you think a bootcamp or a structured learning is is required, then join a bootcamp online. There are multiple of them: machine learning and data science. Uh, and then like learn through that, build projects, showcase your projects to GitHub, to Twitter, or to other social media platforms. Uh, and then reach out to people, understand the interview requirements, prepare for interviews, and that's how you get the job. Um, so right now, uh, I think these days there is no set recipe that you go to XXX college uh, and uh, get to XXX companies. Uh, I think machine learning is everywhere. Uh, technology obviously is the first adopter of machine learning, but now it is trickling down to finance, to healthcare, to construction, to real estate, to everywhere I see. Um, so I think if you have a domain knowledge in a particular field, you don't have to switch. Uh, the domains also, there is enough machine learning happening in your field itself. I think there are a lot of uh, people who are inducted in the data science working in great positions like Chris Ola uh, in Google Brain, um, never went to college. Um, there are a lot of people who actually are working based on their experience and um, their work who are brilliant um, in their output. Uh, and uh, people just think that, you know, it's easier for you to talk like this because you are from IIT. But, you know, it's generally, it, it can happen that, you know, you come from nowhere and you have this natural gift. Um, talk to these people who think that, you know, you have to come from a certain um, alumni um, group to be part of these organizations. Um, so I would not say that alumni groups doesn't help. Like, I would be wrong saying that. Uh, obviously, uh, the network I have from IIT has helped me get some opportunities versus when I didn't have any, any of that network. At the same time today, uh, the internet is very democratized in some sense, and there are enough communities online. They don't have to associate with one particular community like IIT or something. Uh, there are enough Slack channels, enough Discord communities, even, even and enough um, communities within internet itself that you don't have to associate with one kind of people. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't help. It definitely helps uh, to have that degree. So if you have a chance, just go for that. Um, at the same time, though, uh, is it a requirement today? No, right? You can still build your career. You can still kind of learn things. So what people care about, like when I'm hiring for my team, uh, I don't care about which college you come from. I, I care about how much knowledge you have and how, what projects you have done and are those projects or skills that you have are applicable for me. And but because now there is enough demand of these kind of people, uh, and enough jobs available. So the wave is in your side, like this. The, the, we are limited not by demand, but by supply at this point. Um, so if you are willing to put in the hours, I think you can eventually land. Uh, like we are always having hard time hiring people, to be honest, uh, inside our company also, even if it's Facebook. Uh, so if you have the right skills, I think do apply um, and do invest some time in learning about these things. I think you've made a very good point. There are 4x more jobs um, than the people that are available for the jobs. Why do you think there's a rift between uh, uh, there's a ratio like this in data science only? Is it really hard to find a person like this who would be um, such a genius, um, you know, understanding both the business side and the engineering side of the problem? No, I don't think that is the case. It's just the field has been new. Field is new and it has exploded in terms of applications. So if you talk about software engineering, right, let's say backend engineering or front-end engineering, the field has been around for 25 years, uh, essentially. And so people got like, that would have been the case back into early 2000 something that software engineers were already hard to find. Right? I'm very sure. I obviously, I was not in the market at that time. Um, but uh, I think now because it's the new technology, which has a lot of applications people have realized and the applications have exploded. And the number of people, it takes time to get to a point where people have trained enough to kind of do this kind of jobs. Uh, I personally think uh, it is not a genius that is required to do the job. Uh, it's more of a curiosity towards data is required to do the job. 
so as long as you're curious on learning about data and, uh, and are interested in playing with data, uh, I, I think that you can uh, make a career out of this. Um, so I think that's what I would say that like supply is a problem, but it is not a problem because people cannot be trained for it. It's a problem because demand has just uh, exploded in this field. Um, I don't know if you uh, listen to Naval Ravikant, um, such a wonderful and inspirational speaker, and he talks about the fact that, you know, the um, not the availability of knowledge is not a problem anymore. It's the availability of curiosity, which is the problem these days, um, since we were too inundated by the the media um, and the pop culture that people simply don't find enough time to uh, be curious about things. Do you agree with this? You know, in you hire a lot of people, I'm sure that you know, you mentor a lot of people, um, and you work with a lot of young engineers. Did you really see that, you know, this um, shift has been continuous, um, where people are less, less curious and hardworking? Uh, I think it is not about being curious or hardworking. It's I think the attention span has gone down uh, because of like, previously you might be watching a long YouTube video, but now people are spending more time on TikTok, which is a short time video because that's that attention span has shifted from a long form to a short form. So I think the, uh, um, because of this, I think uh, a lot of people are not able to invest time in a long-term thing, which can add a lot more value. And sometimes people want quick results, like by building the most fancy deep learning model, uh, right? Uh, and uh, replying to a problem. Well, that is also good, uh, but you have to kind of put in the work to kind of learn the basics and then go towards the advanced stuff. So I think um, I, I don't, so there is a curiosity, but the curiosity is towards this short term thing, I feel. Um, but I think the curiosity has to be channeled in the right uh, structure. To kind of learn the basics first and then go go towards uh, go towards many fancy things. So I think the uh, the decrease of attention span um, um, for for young people has led to this uh, curiosity being in a, applied in a very different way than in a more structured way. Why do you think that's happening? Uh, it's just uh, if you take the existing algorithm, let's say for machine learning itself. Yeah, there are a lot of codes available on GitHub, right? If you take the existing machine latest computer vision code on GitHub, apply it to your own data, you'll get some results, which are very good. But you never understood how the process of failing to build that algorithm came about. Uh, and if you were to do it yourself, I think it will, you will have a hard time doing it. So you can apply it by using it directly uh, you know, on your data, um, but uh, you don't know how much training people have gone into to kind of build that algorithm from scratch. So I think uh, you have to go through this hard grind to kind of be a complete professional in this field. Uh, and there is no easy way out uh, is what I feel. Um, so I think if people start with basics, they will be much more equipped to understand what is happening behind this uh, like fancy deep learning researches, research that is coming out and also apply it eventually. Um, so I think uh, that's the approach that people are not taking because it's just much easier to kind of clone a GitHub repo apply it to your data, share the, share it on Twitter and get the likes that you want. Um, so I think uh, the, the my advice generally always is like, don't go for initial, like spend in some long-term work, uh, which can to long-term value, and then just a short-term burst on like social media likes or something like that. Do you also think, you know, this dopamine rush of getting likes is kind of slowing down the progress? Um, of real learning in people because I see a lot of um, so-called AI um, leaders mushrooming out of this, um, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook search where they've been glorified for simply sharing the content that someone else has written. Do you really think that that's also happening that, you know, we are creating rock stars uh, faster than engineers? Uh, so I think, uh, uh, well, I, I completely uh, support the idea of sharing things, right? Uh, I think it's a great way and somebody who is spending time on it, like curating the best articles from the internet and sharing it, I think it's a, a very good service in some sense uh, that people should follow uh, that person. Uh, however, I think people should understand that, uh, um, people should understand that people behind the scenes are sometimes not exposed uh, to something like this and people who are sharing things are more exposed. Um, so I think people have to distinguish between that, who is doing some real work in terms of developing this, 
uh, and understand what challenges they have and how they have training on and try to emulate those if you want to be a professional like those. But also I think uh, uh, overall sharing is great uh, in terms of like learning, in terms of knowing things because there are like the amount of papers that come on archive these days, like you cannot keep up, even if you just focus on one field, like graph learning, for example, I don't keep up myself. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, um, uh, I think sharing of interesting bits and pieces is I think a very good idea and people should do, continue to do that. At the same time, people who are learning in the field should realize that that is not, like the person who is sharing is obviously is doing a great job, but is not the builder of those things. So if you want to be a builder, you have to understand what has gone inside and try to follow those people. And those people are sometimes not so much exposed on social media at times. Um, so I think people have to make that distinction right. You know, you have such wonderful and uh, unique ideas um, about things, about experiments, uh, about the word. Uh, and that's also how you got married, um, which was also an interesting story. Um, I think you would make a fantastic advocate for arranged marriages um, these days. Tell us a little bit about how you got your um you know marriage done yeah i think for uh, for me uh yeah i think uh, i i went to a typical arranged indian marriage uh as uh, people might know um uh, is um so i met uh, my my wife now uh, actually through some online portals on some online marriage portals uh, as you would find uh and I dot com. No, it was not Shadi. There was some, there might many of other ones also at that time. So it was definitely not Shadi. Um, but uh, some, someone of one of the online portals, and then uh, uh, I connected with her. And my first call with uh, her was on Skype. Back then, Skype, there was no WhatsApp video calling. Uh, so there was more of Skype. So we kind of uh, talked on Skype one or two times, and then I, I think we connected. Then I wanted to meet her once uh, in person before kind of committing to a marriage. Uh, so I, in the middle of my semester in Berkeley, uh, actually I, I went to India for a day essentially. Uh, so flew from entirely from US to my hometown and I think they, uh, to my hometown and then finally met her uh, for a day. And then, yeah, once I kind of met her, I think it was a choice was very obvious uh, at that time. And then just came back to kind of attend to my studies uh, within a day itself. So I think, yes, uh, people don't do that generally. I understand. Um, but for me, I think it was a great experience to kind of do that once, uh, to, to see the person that you're going to spend your rest of life with, um, uh, before doing anything. And such was the time that, um, like, I don't know, you can do this now in COVID with quarantine requirements and everything else. I don't know if people do that these days. Um, but, uh, but I think that was the time that I could do that. And I think I am happy I did that. Uh, so I have a wonderful marriage, marriage relationship right now. A lot of people will be amazed that, you know, uh, these things exist in the 21st century. And, but I don't think that there's essentially something wrong with this. You know, if someone knows you and someone knows someone else and you, they put you together, uh, it, I mean, technically it's an arranged marriage, but there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, do you really think that that's a better um, path to take um, or, you know, finding someone on your own uh, is probably the best? Yeah, I think to each on his own, like I would not say the path I took is right or path someone else is taking is right. Um, but I think for me, that worked out really well. Uh, that much I can say for sure. Uh, and for other people, it might, uh, the other thing, like you find someone through your, like your real life uh, works out very well. So I found someone virtually, um, but people might have found someone in real life, which also works out great. Ultimately, you have to make sure that the person you're going to spend your rest of life has to connect with you. And if that is there, I think everything is right. Okay. And um, essentially, engineers don't make a very good pickup artist anyway. So <laughs> I think it worked out just fine. Um, lastly, uh, are you also going to pick Y for your children? Um, you would like to. But <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I'll leave that answer for now uh, as unanswered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that might be used against you if this ever saw that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, for being on the show, Ankit. It was a um, wonderful conversation talking about so many um, things um, in um, AI and machine learning, your papers, um, your life views, wonderful experiences. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think that's, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having me, Minaj. I think I enjoyed this conversation a lot. Uh, and I think um, I think for people watching this, I think, uh, yeah, I think 
uh, uh, like make sure that if you are trying to start in this career, uh, you have to take a long term route uh, than a short term. So that's I'll end this here, uh, and um, and you'll get a much more gains in future in life. Thank you so much.